Okay, hi everyone. Welcome to Word on Wednesdays. It's great to see so many of you here with us regularly and I hope that you have been keeping well. I don't have any printed notes for you today, but please feel free to pen uh, whatever notes that you want to take down in your own notebook or paper. Okay, if you don't have any on hand, not to worry, you can go and get them uh, right now, any paper, uh, pen or notebook. And as we begin today, um, as I welcome you, I want to also invite all of us to fully check in. And by that, I mean to be fully present. So set aside every distraction. Try not to multitask while you are at WOW. I know it's tempting uh, to do that you know, when everything is online, but I just want to encourage us to have uh, that posture of being fully present. Okay, so we will now spend uh, the next few minutes to do some thanksgiving. I thought it would be good for us just to take time to centre upon God. So what I would like us to do is to take a pause uh, right now for the next four minutes. Write down at least three things that you are grateful for in the past week. All right, and then on your own, spend time to pray and give thanks to God. So first write it down. It can be big things, it can be small things, it's fine. Whatever things that come to your mind, at least three things that you are grateful for in the past week. And then uh, once you're done, you can, you know, put your reactions a thumbs up or you can give a thumbs up. Uh, but we'll take about four minutes to both uh, write down our thanksgiving as well as pray and give thanks to God. Okay, so shall we do that right now? Let's pause for this four minutes to do this together. So write down three things and then take time on your own to give thanks to God. Okay, so for those of you who just came in, we're writing down three things that we're grateful of for and then taking a few minutes of our own to give thanks to God. We have about two more minutes.
Okay, down to our last minute. Okay, so I hope all of you had a good time just entering into the presence of God to just center upon God and to give thanks, okay? Um, let me now bring this session to God together in prayer. Let's pray. Our good and gracious Father, we thank you that you are always here with us. We thank you for this opportunity to gather together as a church to dig into your word together. We pray that even as we go uh, into Joshua chapter 11 today, God, would you come upon us and give us your wisdom, knowledge, and understanding, your revelation as to who you are, who you reveal yourself to be, Lord, in the scriptures, and help us to respond to you in obedience. So we commit our time to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so um, we're going to do a little bit of a recap uh, right now for Joshua chapter 10. Okay, last week we saw Pastor Kok Guan who took us through Joshua chapter 10 and we saw how the Lord enabled Joshua to defeat the Southern Coalition. All right, and it was, of course, as we saw, a combination of strategic warfare as well as supernatural empowerment from hailstones to the sun standing still. And I think a central theme, uh, as Pastor Kok Guan highlighted to us, was to fight for God and to fight with God. And the chapter comes to a close with uh, chapter 10, verse 42, telling us that and Joshua captured all these kings and their land at one time because the Lord God of Israel fought for Israel. So today we will be covering Joshua chapter 11, but before that, I thought I would take us through a little Bible study method that can help us when we read the text. Okay, so I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with this. I call it the coma method. It's not to put you in a coma, but essentially it's a guide that we can use when we go through the Bible, right? Because sometimes as we read the Bible, it can feel like a whole jumble of words and we're not sure uh, what to pay attention to. We're not sure what to look out for. So I want to encourage you to use this as kind of a framework um, so that as you study your Bible, you will be able to uh, dig in deeper, all right? And coma method stands for context, observation, meaning, and application. So what does uh, context mean? Okay, context refers to the surrounding conditions in which a particular text occurs. So it is uh, good for us to look at the verses before and after the passage. So not just the passage itself, but to look at the preceding uh, verses as well as the verses that come after the passage. And that can help to shed light uh, as to what the meaning of the passage might be. Words alone don't have its full meaning until we know the context in which it is written. So, for example, maybe one year ago, you know, like a full year ago or even up to two years ago, if I told you, hey, you know, I received a box of face masks as a gift. I think many of you would think that what I received was one of those beauty facial masks, right? The kind that, you know, you put on your face before you go to sleep to beautify yourself. But now, when I tell you the same sentence that I received a box of face masks, I think you would most probably assume that it was a box of surgical masks. Why? Because we are living in the context of COVID-19, right? So common words uh, would have taken on, in a sense, different meanings because of the current context that we are in. So it's helpful for us to find out what the overall context of a book is before we get started. And here are some questions that we can ask. When was this book written? Who wrote this book? 
why was the book written? And was there a particular audience uh, that the author was writing this book for? What is the genre of the book? So I think as Pastor Kogwan as well as Pastor Darren, uh, they covered, you know, that uh, the book of Joshua is like a hi historical biblical narrative. And a lot of it is descriptive rather than prescriptive. And knowing this gives us some handles uh, as to how to respond uh, to some of the things that come up in the Bible passage. Okay, so it's good for us to know what the context is uh, of the book as well as the specific passage that we are going through. Observation um, is to carefully examine the passage that we are reading okay, with questions. And uh, I think we have worked through this template before. It's called the five W's and one H. All right, and that stands for who, what, when, why, where, and how. So you can ask questions like, as you read verse by verse, who is speaking? Who are the main characters? Who is this about? Uh, what is the immediate background to this text? What is the subject that is being covered here? What are the repeated words and phrases? What are the repeated words and phrases in Joshua? I'm sure it is no surprise to us, right, that we keep reading uh, the Lord's assurance to Joshua, do not be afraid, all right? And then when, when did this happen? Or when would these events happen? What is the significance of it and where? So you would notice in Joshua that there is a lot of physical physical uh, locations that are being mentioned. What is the significance of the geography of that particular area? So going to find out some of these things could be helpful for us to understand uh, why it is mentioned and, and, and how it links to the overall story. All right. And then of course, why? Why would this happen? Why does the author raise these issues? Why does he use certain words? Why uh, is this uh, being mentioned here and not there? And then how? How would this happen? How does this passage relate to the larger context or how do I respond to this? Okay, so these are some uh, questions that you can ask as you make observations. And then following this, we go into meaning. Okay, so meaning refers to the main point or the idea that perhaps the original human author wanted his original audience to understand in a particular text. And this is the point where you kind of make sense of all your observations as you write down those questions. And of course, you try to answer those questions yourself. Um, then this is the so what moment. Like, so now that you know all of this, what does this all mean? Okay, and I want to encourage you that how we make meaning of a text is that at the end we have to point back, um, sorry, we have to point back whatever that we uh, have learned back to God, back to Jesus. What do we learn about Him? Because as we learn uh, about God, then we can make the right applications as a response to the character of God. And of course, the last one is application. So this refers to how us as the reader is supposed to respond to the text. What does the Lord require of you? So here we have an acronym um, called SPACE, okay, and it's really for us uh, to know that if we don't process what we are learning, then we won't be so intentional to apply all that we have learned. And some of these uh, could be, you, you may not apply all of this uh, every time you do a Bible study, but this is a template for us to think about um, what sin we might need to confess, what are the promises to claim, what are the attitudes to change, what are the commands to obey, and what are the examples to follow. Okay, so I just want to encourage us, you know, because um, reading the Bible alone doesn't change lives, but it is applied truth that leads to life transformation. So as we read the Bible, let us be intentional to ask God, uh, what and who is he revealing himself to be and how are we to respond to him? All right, so there you have the coma method. I hope you had some helpful handles on how to study the Bible of your own. If you didn't catch all of that, it's okay. Don't worry. These slides will be uploaded uh, to the BBTC WOW page, so you can also uh, take a look later on. And I want to encourage you to do this in your own quiet time. You could even do this for Joshua chapter 12 uh, before we meet again next week. Okay, so let's get started on Joshua chapter 11. All right, so... Um, Following the example of uh, Pastor Kogwan, I will be asking uh, some of you to help us to read the text uh, aloud. Okay, so Joshua 11, 1 to 3. Um, can I have Sherry? Is Sherry there? Sherry Yo? Can you read it for us? No? Um, Adeline? Adeline Lo?
one is there. Um, someone else? Uh, Agnes, Auntie Agnes, can you read for us this particular text? Okay, Pastor Fari, we can read for you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, uh, Joshua 11 verse 1. When Jabin, king of Hazor, heard of this, he sent to Jobab, king of Madon, and to the king of Shimron, and to the king of Akshaf, and to the kings who were in the northern hill country, and in the Arabah sound of south of Chinaroth, and in the lowland, and in Nafoth Dor on the west, to the Canaanites in the east and the west, to the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, and the Jebusites in the hill country, and the Hivites under Hermon in the land of Mizpah. Natalie is here, she will continue. Okay, thank you. Okay, Nat, you read the next slide, okay? Uh, okay. The next, next slide, okay. So, all right, so we'll take a pause here. Thank you, uh, Nata. So as with chapter 9 and 10, uh, chapter 11 begins again with kings hearing news of defeat. Okay, so if you would notice in the last uh, two chapters, it always begins with kings hearing news of defeat. And then they respond by gathering their troops. So as Jabin, the king of Hazor, hears of the crushing defeat of news that Joshua had captured all five kings and their lands, uh, and it devoted, you know, all these were devoted to destruction, he moves to form an even bigger coalition in the north. Okay, so this northern uh, coalition was Israel's most formidable foe in terms of both numbers as well as weaponry. As you will read later on, you would see that they had horses and chariots. Okay, so... Um, after he passes the test of sacrificing Isaac, right? So here you see the same uh, phrase used, but in two very different contexts, right? Now it is used to describe the vastness of the enemies that are coming against Israel. And they were usually pulled by two horses. So they were enforced with iron and they were effective uh, largely, of course, on flat ground. Can you imagine if they want to slope? Uh, horses and chariots would definitely be a burden to them. So in contrast, we see the Israelites who were a nomadic people. And they had no such equipment and uh, no such machinery to boast of. Um, and in that sense, they had always traveled light. So they traveled light because their military power uh, was not in fancy equipment, but it was in the Lord. And of course, as a nomadic people moving in search of that promised land, uh, they had to travel light as well. So the Lord already knew, you know, that his people would enter or would uh, encounter battles such as these. And so he prepared them when he spoke to them in Deuteronomy uh, 21. Okay, so here we have the uh, reference in Deuteronomy 21. God tells Israel, when you go to war against your enemies and see horses and chariots and an army larger than your own, you shall not be afraid of them. For the Lord your God is with you, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. So now he is about to call upon Joshua and Israel to remember the word that has already been given, that you will face all of this, but be assured that I am with you in battle. Okay, so Joshua 11, 5 to 6, uh, I will just read in case of any other technical error. Um, and all these uh, kings joined their forces and encamped together and came and encamped together at the waters of Merom to fight against Israel. And the Lord said to Joshua, Do not be afraid of them, for tomorrow at this time I will give over all of them slain to Israel. You shall hamstring their horses and burn their chariots with fire. So in the face of this uh, extremely threatening and formidable sight of the enemies, the Lord again uh, assures Joshua not to be afraid. In fact, in 24 hours' time, the Lord himself will give them over slain to Israel, and the enemies will be completely crushed and defeated. 
The only thing that Israel had left to do is to hamstring their horses and burn their chariots with fire. Of course, this itself was no easy task. It was very back-breaking work, right? And what is hamstringing? So hamstringing uh, involves cutting the hamstring muscles of the horse's legs. Okay, so hamstringing the horses and burning the chariots both would then have two effects. So one, uh, the enemy could no longer use them again. And two, neither could the Israelites. So perhaps we may ask, as with the case of the spoils of war, why didn't God allow Joshua and the people to just keep the horses and chariots? I mean, why? You know, since he already allowed them to keep all those things, wouldn't these things come in useful later on? Well, I think God very likely did not want the Israelites to become reliant on these weapons of war because their dependency as a people of God must always be on him, not in the things that they had, and certainly not in the enemy's sources of security, of horses and man-made chariots. In verse 7 to 8, So Joshua and all his warriors came suddenly against them by the waters of Merom and fell upon them. And the Lord gave them into the hand of Israel, who struck them and chased them as far as Great Sidon, Misrephophem, and eastward as far as the valley of Mispath. And they struck them until he left none remaining. So as we see in, um, as in the previous account in Joshua uh, 10.9, where we are told that Joshua came upon them suddenly, having marched up all night from Gilgal, and the Lord throwing the enemies into a panic. Uh, this time we see in a sense the same uh, shock element, where Joshua and all his warriors came suddenly upon them by the waters, and the Lord gave them into the hand of Israel. So while we do not see any supernatural hailstones here, um, the Lord nonetheless fulfills every promise that he had made, um, to deliver the enemies uh, into uh, Israel's hand, and there was none, none left uh, remaining. Okay, and then in verse 9 and 10, And Joshua did to them just as the Lord said to him. He hamstrung their horses and burned their chariots with fire, and Joshua turned back at that time and captured Hazer and struck its king with the sword. For Hazer formerly was the head of all those kingdoms, and they struck with the sword all who were in it, devoting them to destruction. There was none left that breathed, and he burned Hazer with fire. So here we see that the Lord did exactly what he said he would do. And in verse 9, Joshua did to them just as the Lord had commanded. The destruction that we see is complete, is total. And the phrases that are used show the extent of God's judgment on Hazel, right? So you see what I highlighted there? Uh, captured Hazel, struck its king, struck with the sword all who were in it, devoting them to destruction. There was none left that breathed, burn Hazel with fire. So these were these were, were words, uh, you know, that that really showed the extent uh, of Hazel's destruction, because nothing can withstand the judgment of God. So I did a little search uh, for Hazel and on biblical archaeology, and here are some of the findings. Okay, so these are the ruins of Hazel. Um, this was from an article in 2019, and they came across a beautifully uh, constructed and preserved staircase within the Hazel site ruins. Uh, actually, you can kind of uh, see it, right? It's uh, here. Okay, can you see this uh, staircase over here? It looks almost like perfectly like it had just been laid there. Uh, and this could have been stairs leading to a courtyard within palace grounds. Um, this suggests a city that was indeed very grand, very powerful at one time, probably ahead of its neighbours. And um, this was probably a subsequent rebuilding long after the initial destruction of Hazel by Joshua. Okay, so this, this was not the site that uh, remained after Joshua burned it um, to the ground. This was actually a rebuilding after that. But still, you could see the semblance of grandeur uh, once upon a time. 
And this city was first uh, investigated in 1928 by a British archaeologist. And excavations uh, later started in the 1950s. You'll be able to read studies on that. And it continued at intervals for many decades, uh, even up to 2012. So from the archaeological uh, evidence, it showed that a very violent fire had destroyed the palace in about 13th century BC. So that was... Um, probably that time uh, period, you know, uh, where Joshua was uh, taking the land. And the fire was so intense with temperatures going up to two times more than the temperatures of a normal fire. And it says here, you know, that it was up to a stunning 1,300 degrees Celsius. So it completely melted um, the clay vessels and the mud bricks that the walls were made of. And of course, the question was asked, who did this and how did this happen? So we know the answer to be Joshua and the Israelites. And indeed, those studies, um, uh, even though that are non-Christian based, they did have certain speculations on who attacked the city and how the city got uh, raised to the ground. Um, but in the end, the biblical reason, which is that you know it was a conquest by Joshua, by Israel, was the strongest reason for it. And one suggestion on how the city got burned in this way is that there was a combination of large quantities of wood that was used for the building um, and olive oil that was stored in the rooms. So, you know, with strong winds and everything, uh, yeah, when, the, when, when Israelites set it on fire, it, it just went, in a sense, uh, viral. Like It just went completely uh, to destroy everything. And actually, after this destruction, they found that the city remained uninhabited for about 200 years uh, before rebuilding subsequently began. So I thought this was just uh, something interesting for us um, to know that uh, Hazel is real, you know, and even archaeological evidence shows that at one time, this city was burned completely to the ground. Okay, so we move on to Joshua 11, 12. And all the cities of those kings and all their kings Joshua captured and struck them with the edge of the sword, devoting them to destruction just as Moses, um, the servant of the Lord, had commanded. Again, Joshua's obedience is emphasized here as Joshua honors uh, Moses' instructions to Joshua. So we see the phrase there, servant of the Lord. Um, and that is actually a term of honor. You know, it is a term used to describe Moses because truly he was a man who had seen the face of God, right, and still lived. Uh, and it encapsulated the heart of who Moses is, which was to serve and to love God. And as Moses had represented God to the people, um, Joshua now represents God to the people. So I think the one thing that we have observed, especially for those of you who have been with us uh, all the way from Joshua chapter 1, as, as we go through chapter after chapter, we see that the most important thing that Joshua consistently did was to fulfill everything that Moses had uh, commanded him, everything that the Lord had spoken to him, Joshua did. Okay, and then in verse 13, we are told, but none of the cities that stood on mounts did Israel burn, except Hazor alone that Joshua burned. So what are mounts, M-O-U-N-D-S? Uh, mounts is actually a, a Hebrew term meaning tell, T-E-L, or ruins. Okay, so each time uh, there was a rebuilding that used the same site, a mound or a hill was formed known as tell. Okay, so um, so this means that these cities that uh, his, uh, that Joshua didn't burn uh, were existing uh, tells. Okay, so these were already rebuilt in that sense. There was a certain history uh, to that place. And today, Hazer is actually known as Tel Hazer because uh, rebuilding had occurred on the same site. But at that time, uh, there was no, it was not on the mound uh, because it was, I guess, a city that had never been uh, built upon earlier. Okay, so why did Joshua not burn the rest of these uh, cities on mounds? Uh, one reason, of course, could be that some of these cities were already designated to become the property of the different tribes later on. Uh, another reason could be that these were older, more influential towns uh, that previous generations had rebuilt their former ruins, right? Because Atel is a kind of uh, city that has been rebuilt upon. So perhaps Joshua did not burn them because he wanted to preserve uh, these towns with time-honored sites for the Israelites' occupation. In any case, Hazel at that point was the strongest 
and most important uh, of the northern stronghold. So it would now be completely burned. And if you can think back with me, uh, do you remember which were the two other cities that were also burned to the ground? Not every city uh, that Joshua took, he burned to the ground. But what were the other two cities um, that Joshua burned to the ground? Okay, they are Jericho uh, and I. All right, so here you see in uh, Joshua chapter 6, 24, uh, Jericho, where they burned the city with fire and everything in it, only the silver and gold and the vessels of bronze and of iron, they put into the treasury of the house of God. Okay, and then in uh, Joshua chapter 8, 19, it speaks of I and the men in the ambush rose quickly out of their place. And as soon as he had stretched out his hand, they ran and entered the city and captured it. And they hurried to set the city on fire. Okay, so these were the two cities um, that had resisted Israel occupation. Uh, and therefore, you know, they suffered uh, total devastation as Hazel now faced. Of course, these were also very formidable cities. And we see um, that there is a common fate that befalls upon all those who oppose the Lord, which is complete destruction. So maybe right here, uh, right now, we'll just take a pause for like two minutes, okay? And I thought it's important for us to just have time to consider for ourselves, in what ways do we find, uh, do we ourselves find it hard to submit to God? And is God speaking to us about it? And I want to suggest to us that sometimes the way we resist God may not be in such an obvious way as the Northern Coalition, where they deliberately gathered up, uh, gathered their troops to come against Israel. But perhaps the way that we find it hard to submit to God, you know, are the times where we may lament against God for giving us things that we don't really care about. You know, we don't really want this or we don't really like this. I don't know why God keeps giving us this or blessing us with this when I don't really care about this. Um, and wishing, you know, that he would give us something else. Or perhaps wishing that God would simply do as he is told by us. Or maybe for some of us, it may be a struggle to flow with authority figures or to flow with a plan that we have felt that we had no part of, that it was just put upon us? Or are we in a situation of stress and strife that could have been avoided if we would just be willing to flow with God? When we oppose God, we bring about our own destruction. But sometimes the way in which we resist God may not be in such obvious ways. And that is where we need to pause and to check our heart. So I thought I just want to give us this two minutes right now. Give us time to just pause and to think and ask, you know, the Lord um, to search our hearts and, and show us if there have been ways in which we have resisted uh, submitting to God. And what is T speaking to us about? Okay, so just take the next two minutes on our own right now, and then we'll come back.
Okay, I hope you have had some time uh, to reflect and respond to God. We will now move on. Okay, Joshua chapter 11, 14 to 15. And all the spoil of these cities and the livestock, the people of Israel took for their plunder. But every person they struck with the edge of the sword until they had destroyed them, and they did not leave any who breathed. Just as the Lord had commanded Moses his servant, so Moses commanded Joshua, and so Joshua did. He left nothing undone of all that the Lord had commanded Moses. So again and again, we see the repeated emphasis on total obedience. The Lord spoke to Moses. Moses obeyed. He commanded Joshua. And then Joshua obeyed exactly as he had been commanded. There was no broken telephone between God, Moses, and Joshua. And the results are a line of blessing that prevail through that. So I thought this might be um, a pictorial uh, symbol, you know. I imagine that visually, it's like a continuously long pipe, okay, between generations to generations. And as long as there is no disconnect anywhere, the blessings that follows obedience will flow. It will come. Because God wants to bless us. But it is important that we do things God's way in God's time, not to run ahead of him or to fall behind him, that to be in step with him and to ask of him what he desires for us to do and how to go about it. So there are times where we do the right things, but it is not in the right time. And I think to us, you know, I think many of us would then ask, but how do we know? Um, I don't have a model answer here, but all I can say is that as you commune with God, he will tell you. And I think Joshua had that continuous uh, communication with God. He had that continuous relationship with God, the way that Moses did uh, with God. And of course, Moses imparted to Joshua. And as Joshua received this, he acted upon it. So I just want to encourage us, you know, to constantly be connected with him, to know that the heart of God is always to bless. It's not to destroy us, you know, but we must obey. We must follow him. And then we move to verse uh, 16 to 18. So Joshua took all that land, the hill country and all the Negev, and all the land of Goshen and the lowland and the Arabah and the hill country of Israel and its lowland from Mount Halak, which rises towards Seir, as far as Bel Gat in the valley of Lebanon below Mount Hermon. And he captured all their kings and struck them and put them to death. Joshua made war a long time with all those kings. So if we see the sequence of uh, verbs, you know, being used, right? These are action words. We see in verse 16 that Joshua took all that land. And then in verse 17, we saw that he captured all their kings. He struck them. He put them to death. And I think here you can see a very aggressive and a very destructive uh, nature of action that is happening uh, right here. It also seems uh, or feels like it's pretty fast moving. I think as you read through um, the book of Joshua 11, it just feels like a whole uh, chronicle of uh, deaths, lah, you know, of destruction. And it feels like pretty fast moving action of Joshua conquering the land. Um, but then there's kind of like this like pause in verse 18. And suddenly uh, we are made to realize that no, not all of the battles uh, were won overnight. In fact, the battles here took a long time because verse 18 tells us that Joshua made war a long time with all those kings. So it was not an overnight situation like Hazor. And the implication uh, here is that there are additional uh, battles as well that were not explicitly described uh, here, but it was ongoing in the background. And I think something for us to note um, also is the emphasis that it was the kings who had opposed Joshua. So we do not know what the people um, of the country thought, but the ruling elite, at least we know, were opposed to Joshua. And that resistance led to a long battle. So victory was at hand, but it is not immediate. 
and the war took a long time. I think perhaps this speaks to us as well in our own personal battles that sometimes victory is immediate, but sometimes victory is hard won over a long and arduous process. And I want to assure you um, and just say to you at this point that it is no measure of God's love for us, the length of battle. We always have the assurance that God is for us and that he is still with us through it all, whether the battle is long or whether the battle is short. And we must look to God for continued stamina, for continued focus to press on. So moving to Joshua 11, 19 to 20, there was not a city that made peace with the people of Israel, except the Hivites, the inhabitants of Gibeon. They took them all in battle. For it was the Lord's doing to harden their hearts that they should come against Israel in battle in order that they should be devoted to destruction and should receive no mercy but be destroyed, just as the Lord commanded Moses. So here we are reminded again, uh, very interestingly, right, in this last uh, three chapters of the Gibeonites, uh, again, we're reminded of their peace treaty with Israel. And because of the Gibeonite leadership decision to do so, uh, even though it was by means of trickery, uh, nonetheless, the Gibeonites gained the peace and protection of Israel because Israel was a country uh, of honor where they honored uh, their covenant. Um, but for everyone else that you saw whose kings opposed the Lord, they were destroyed. And I thought here, you know, it is an important principle for us to know that the rulers and the governments of countries matter. Why do they matter? Because, I mean, as citizens of a country, right, the decisions that our rulers make have an impact upon the well-being and fate of the country. And for us, I think, as residents uh, in Singapore, it is our responsibility as believers to continually uphold our leadership in prayer to be upright, to be compassionate, to be God-fearing, to do things of integrity, to do things of justice, uh, of goodness to its citizens. And I think it is our responsibility to intercede for our country and to pray actively for our leaders who are governing uh, the country. Because the way in which a leader chooses um, to govern uh, the country and the decisions that they make will have great and far-reaching implications. As you can see from here, the kings that chose to oppose um, the Lord um, gathered all their people and they were all, in a sense, uh, destroyed um, as well when they decided to oppose the Lord. So I think for us here, you know, I thought we should just uh, remember that the rulers and, and um, people who are governing our country, they matter. And as believers, it is our responsibility um, to pray for them. So coming back to verse 20, it tells us here that all these were the Lord's doing to harden their hearts. So I thought, you know, as we read something like that, some of us may feel uncomfortable, you know, but what do you mean by it's the Lord's doing? So if it's the Lord's doing, then how can anyone in that sense undo it, right? Were they like forced, uh, you know, against their will? So I want to posit here, you know, that this is not an issue of free will, um, but it is a way to say that God has control over human events to eventually accomplish his purposes. And this phrase, harden heart, you might be familiar, was also used repeatedly to describe Pharaoh. So this was a case where his heart was hardened, both by God as well as by himself, as you read Exodus 4 to 14. Um, and, you know, through all of this, he didn't want to let the people go. Okay, he would say, okay, they can go, and then he would harden his heart and then not let the people go. And his hardened heart increased the intensity of the suffering against Israel. And at the end of that, you know, I, I, with all uh, the abuse um, that Israel had endured, it made them ready. It made them ready um, to leave Egypt. Of course, you would know that after that, they still continued complaining and whining. Um, but definitely with the hardened heart uh, of Pharaoh against them, uh, it made it a bit easier la, for them to want to exit. So similarly, we are told that the hearts of these Canaanite kings were opposed against God and they continued to be so um, because it was in God's plan that they would eventually be judged and completely destroyed. 
And some of us may perhaps ask this question, you know, why can't they be allowed to live um, and just let Israel convert them to become followers of Yahweh? I think the Lord knows that our hearts are prone to idolatry, that our hearts are given to idolatry so, so easily, and He wants to protect us from that. And I think in the context of these um, cities all around Israel, if these idolatrous uh, nations had already witnessed the battles of Israel, and if you're talking about the Northern Coalition, they had already seen all the earlier battles of Israel, and they knew that this is of supernatural intervention. They knew that there was a God acting for them, and yet they chose not to come to faith. Yet they chose to continue to oppose the Lord. How likely do you think it is that they will come to faith when they were finally conquered? I'm not saying that they won't, you know, but I'm saying that God has already given those chances. And you would see, of course, in as we studied Joshua, there are people who have sojourners who have crossed over to Israel's side. Someone like Rahab, who redeemed not just herself, but her entire uh, family, her entire clan to come over. When she saw um, the hand of God acting for God's people, she wanted to be on that side. So the Lord knows, you know, that the temptation for his people to be lured away to idolatry is far too great. And the only way is to completely eradicate it. And these are his commands in Deuteronomy 7, 1 to 5. When the Lord your God brings you into the land that you're entering to take possession of it and clears away many nations before you, the Hittites, the Gigersites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, Jebusites, seven nations more numerous and mightier than you. And when the Lord your God gives them over to you and you defeat them, then you must devote them to complete destruction. You shall make no covenant with them and show no mercy to them. Sorry, that should be Deuteronomy. You shall not intermarry with them, giving your daughters to their sons or taking their daughters for your sons, for they would turn away your sons from following me to serve other gods. Then the anger of the Lord will be kindled against you and he would destroy you quickly. But thus shall you deal with them. You shall break down their altars and dash in pieces their pillars and chop down their ashram and burn uh, their calf images with fire. So actually earlier when I talked about the Hazel um, site, there were some studies that said that they managed to find um, like scraps, you know, of uh, former gods and altars that were completely destroyed. Like, yeah, the, like the gods had all their arms and all that just completely chopped off. And you could see that Israel took this uh, command seriously, you know, and God essentially lays it down for them what they need to do when they came into the promised land, which is to destroy the inhabitants of the land, have no mercy, make no covenant, do not intermarry, destroy their altars, because this will help to remove the temptation to follow other gods. And in order, in a sense, to enable her to keep the commandment, God caused her enemies to fight her rather than seek mercy and peace. So we have also in the New Testament, in 1 Corinthians 10, uh, 13, No temptation has overtaken you that is not common, common to men, because God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. And of course, James chapter 4, 7, Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. In the New Testament, we have a similar principle fleshed out from us, right? Which is to flee from temptation, resist the devil, and submit to the Lord who will help us. Nowhere does it say that we are to intentionally surround ourselves with temptation uh, and then try to fight it. You know, for really God's wisdom is such that flee, go far away, you know, extinguish all temptation. Do not put yourself in that place. Cling on to God instead. So we see that this is all in God's wisdom to help us to protect ourselves from the idolatry that he knows uh, can destroy us. So coming back to Joshua 11, uh, 21, And Joshua came at that time and cut off the Anakim from the hill country from Hebron, from Debir, from Anak, and from all the hill country of Judah, and from all the hill country of Israel. Joshua devoted them to destruction with their cities. Okay, so 
here we can see uh, this, this names, right? Uh, the Anakims. So who were the Anakims? Anak actually uh, means long neck. And it is used to describe a very uh, tall tribal group that inhabited the land. So these were probably the same people, the same people that filled um, the ten spies' hearts with terror when they saw them in the promised land, in the first uh, spying out. So you would see the reference in Numbers uh, 13, 28 and Deuteronomy 1, uh, 28, right? So you can see here. Um, that, the city, that the people who dwell in the land are strong and the cities are fortified and large. We saw the descendants of Anak there. And in Deuteronomy, again, our brothers have made our hearts melt, saying the people are greater and taller than we. You know, the cities are great and fortified up to heaven. We have seen the sons of the Anakim. So, of course, tall people would inhabit tall spaces, lah, right? You cannot be like giants and then, you know, your, your, your surrounding buildings are very small. So, obviously, the size of the city would have to match on the size of the people who were living there. And this was obviously um, very, very gigantic, literally, um, territory. Uh, so, in short, the Anakims were giants, you know, and did that stop? Uh, Joshua and Israel from taking them. We see in verse 22, there was none of the Anakim left in the land of the people of Israel. Only in Gaza, in Gath, and in Ashdod did some remain. So even though the Anakim were giants, and these were the same people uh, that scared the ten spies um, into giving such a bad report to the rest of Israel, we see here that Joshua managed to destroy them. And in fact, it's mentioned pretty nonchalantly, you know, like, okay, yeah, there were these people and Joshua described, uh, destroyed them. And we won't really know, you know, unless we go and find out who are the Anakims. And then we realize the kind of uh, people, you know, that Joshua was actually facing. Uh, but we do, we do notice uh, here that it, they were not, in a sense, completely destroyed because some remain in Gaza, Gaff, and in Ashdod. And I think herein is where we later see these enemies come back uh, to taunt Israel in the form of Goliath of Gath. He was probably related or descended from uh, the Anakim um, tribe. Okay, so you would see that reference there in 1 Samuel 17, 4, that Goliath came from Gath. Okay, and then finally, we conclude with Joshua eleven twenty three. So Joshua took the whole land according to all that the Lord had spoken to Moses. And Joshua gave it for an inheritance to Israel according to their tribal allotments. And the land had rest from war. So we now conclude with um, this verse, which uh, tells us that the wars are finally over. And the, la the land uh, now had rest. Okay, so um, this verse seems to suggest that the entire land uh, is conquered. Okay, um, but this is not entirely so. As you will see this, um, because as you begin to read Judges 1 to 3, you would actually uh, see that there were pockets of the land that was not completely uh, conquered. You know, so sometimes when we read um, certain uh, things like that in, in the biblical narrative, it can feel a little bit confusing. And I think this is where we need to understand one of the techniques that a lot of these um, historical narrative writers use, and that is the use of hyperbole. Okay, so a lot of them tend to use hyperbole to make a point. What are hyperboles? So hyperboles are extreme or sometimes extravagant statements to emphasize a point. So remember the verse earlier where we read um, to say that the enemies uh, were as vast as like the sand on a seashore. Okay, so that is a hyperbole to basically illustrate a point, not literally that is like every piece of sand on the seashore, you know, but it is to show that it is a huge number. It is vast. Okay, and this was a common uh, technique, not just in biblical uh, conquest narratives like Joshua, but it was actually a very common technique used uh, in that of the ancient Near East. So ancient Near East, uh, the whole cluster, all the site, 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 I, I, I countries that you just read about, those uh, entire, uh, the entire region is called the ancient uh, Near East. Okay, so if you read um, extra biblical uh, records. If you read their own traditional folklore stories, historical narrative, uh, conquest narratives uh, in that time, you would see um, that they wrote very dramatically. And hyperbole 
in that sense was the norm because they wanted to emphasize their conquest or their victory. So you read things like all of them were taken down in battle. But this does it mean that every single person uh, died? Does it mean that nobody survived at all? Um, sometimes it may not be so, but it would, it would mean that most of them died that there was a great victory, okay? So I think sometimes it could be hard for us, uh, especially for those of us who may not be used to reading uh, liter literary techniques such as this, to think that, huh, so is the Bible lying to me? Um, it's not. But just to understand that this is a certain technique to emphasize um, a point. Um, so at least for here, I think it is sufficient for us to know uh, that the major wars were over. Okay, so from this point onward, at least, uh, there will be no more major wars. And now we would await the division of the land uh, to come. Okay. So, um, okay, so what are some uh, learning points? I think there are, of course, again, uh, many different things, you know, that have come up in our study together. Um, but I thought one of the things uh, that stood out for me is that when God is on our side, we fight from a position of victory. And how to get on God's side? It is simply to do as he says. So the Lord will do as he says if we do as he says. Okay, it's a bit of a tongue twister there, right? But the Lord will do as he says if we do as he says. So the condition being that of our obedience. And I think we see, you know, that 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 one running theme of Joshua uh, truly week after week is obedience. And Joshua 11 continues to show us that with Joshua's continued obedience comes the Lord's continued victory. And when God is on our side, we fight from a position of victory. So we may not know how long the battle may be. And as we saw in verse 18, sometimes the battle can be a very long one. But I want to encourage us to take heart because he is with us and he is for us. And I think as long as we keep doing what he has called us to do, there is no reason why God will withhold his blessings. And today, as I was um, preparing for today's lesson, um, the Lord reminded me again of the time where he fought for me, where he fought for our family. And I think as many of you uh, would know, you know, I had a difficult first pregnancy when I was uh, diagnosed with lupus midway. And my first son, Ethan, actually stopped uh, growing in my womb at week 26 kind of thing. So when they saw the scans, uh, it looked bad. And when I was actually referred to um, a fetal uh, abnormalities uh, specialist, he said that actually the scans look like, you know, Ethan would be quite abnormal on birth. And I remember he said the phrase that he used was, there are abnormalities that are compatible with life, like, for example, Down syndrome, and that's okay. But then there are abnormalities that are incompatible with life, where the person would not even be able to function. And I think when I receive news like that, you, you know, fear just like struck me, right? And it's hard not to be overwhelmed and terrified um, at moments like that. And to feel like actually your prayers mean nothing in the face of medical scans and doctor's report, you know, when they show it to you. But the Lord assured my husband and I throughout, you know, that the church was interceding for us um, and he will act for us. And we just needed to be rooted in him. We just needed to rest in him, even when things around us was not at rest or things within me was not at rest. And I think the one thing that I learned um, through all of this, you know, is that I cannot control the process or how the exact outcome will be like. There were many people who messaged me uh, and told me, you know, uh, what they thought um, would happen or how victory might look like. Um, and for some of them, you know, victory would mean that I'm healed of lupus. Uh, for some of them, uh, victory would be that I would have a normal 40-week uh, pregnancy, you know. And I think at that point, when I was bringing all this before the Lord, he was just showing me that my journey is going to look very different, but I will be no less victorious because my victory is not in how things look like, but my victory is found by being rested in him. And I think as we have learned today, sometimes victory is immediate. 
And sometimes these are the only stories that you hear, you know, that are being shared uh, on the pulpit or, yeah, or on encouraging websites. And there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, but sometimes there are victories that are fought over a very long period of time. And I want to encourage us here, you know, that if you're going through a tough time right now, especially during this circuit uh, breaker season, don't be afraid. Some of us may be exhausted from work. Some of us may be uh, fearful because we are out of work. Some of us may be dealing with a lot of family uh, issues and situations uh, and stresses and domestic violence and all kinds of things, you know, and each of us have our own battles. But I want to encourage you to please not be discouraged. With every battle that Joshua won, the enemies got more and more formidable. And I think for Joshua, I feel like it can be so it can be so easy to feel overwhelmed at that moment. Like you you really can't catch a break, you know. You thought you just crossed one battle, you know, the Lord fought for you. Oh, then you enter into another one, even worse than the previous one. And it feels like maybe I shouldn't be so victorious, lah. Then maybe the next one won't be so epic, you know. Um, but no, you know, I mean God was with him throughout and God came through for Joshua uh, and Israel all the more. The greater the enemy, um, the greater uh, the Lord showed himself to be. So I want to encourage all of us, you know, not to be afraid, to be strong, to be courageous, to keep following Jesus, and he will see you through no matter what. Joshua 1 9, have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And those are my uh, closing words um, to you, my encouragement to you. Um, you know, I would love to hear your own stories of uh, battles and victories in the Lord as well. And I thought as we come to a close for this particular segment, is to encourage us again to reflect and to respond to Him. What does the Lord require of you today? And in your own study, what have you learned about God today? Do you have questions for Him? So we won't be able to do this right now. But after the session, I want to encourage you to take time to be with God, to respond to Him, and um, go through the text again, you know, and ask the Holy Spirit to continue to reveal to you uh, who He is and how you are to respond to Him. Okay, so I'm going to close us uh, in prayer during this time. And then after that, we uh, can do Q&A where Pastor Gokguan will also uh, answer whatever questions that you have. I have not looked at the chat, okay? So, because I, I cannot, I cannot uh, focus on so many things. So I will look at the chat after this, but I will close in prayer uh, first, all right? So let's pray. Gracious Father, we just want to give you thanks for today that you have shown us how you are a promise-keeping God. We thank you that you are a faithful God through the generations of God. That even as you were with Moses and you were with Joshua, you are still here with us today. In whatever season, in whatever challenge that we are in, Lord, whether victory has been easily won or victory seems to be so far out of reach, Lord, we thank you for the powerful assurance that you are here and that you are, you are our deliverer. So help us, O oh God, not to fear, but to cling on to you and to be faithful, to follow you and to follow what you tell us to do in your word. And so we want to bring before you all that we have learned today, Lord. Help us to process it, help us to personalize it and respond to you personally in obedience. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay. Thank you, uh, everyone. So sorry for the technical uh, error um, just now. So, okay, so it's 9.30 right now. I want to thank uh, everyone for being here with us. Again, sorry for the technical difficulty. Um, and it was a pleasure to be with all of you. Maybe I just get Pastor Kogwai to close us in prayer. Is that okay? Yeah. Um, maybe just one point to add um, that uh, the last question that I posed to you all is what is the one question or so what are the questions that you have in mind, you know, uh, after you do the Bible study? I, I, I'm actually thankful that, you know, you're asking questions, uh, you know, even after the, the Bible study because the reality is that um, it should keep you thinking. Yeah, we, we, we shouldn't be um, giving you everything, you know, at the, at the end of the day, it should keep you thinking and then after that, you know, uh, it excite you to go and find out more as the Lord reveal himself to you. So I think this is actually the, the goal of uh, uh, wow at the end of the day. Yeah, so, so 
um, it's just a bit of how much we have studied. This is what we know. But the thing is that it, it should keep you um, uh, digging into the Word of God and asking God all these questions. Yeah, so please continue to do so. And the Lord bless you. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this time. We thank you so much for Pastor Feli for making time to prepare, you know, to, to teach us. And uh, we just give thanks to you for this wonderful sister. We pray the Lord you will uh, bless her and also even the, the words that go for this uh, evening, the Lord will not, not return to you void, but will accomplish whatever the Lord you desire. I'm sure, Lord, that you have spoken, spoken to each one of us, you know, in a, uh, in a specific and a, a special way. The Lord will not just be hearers of your word, but we will be doers as well. We will know exactly what you want us to do. And for the questions that we still have in mind, that we are not too sure. Lord, help us uh, to be able to just wrestle and to think through and to process so that we can get to know you better. So it's not just about gaining knowledge, but Lord, um, you bring about this life transformation, you know, that Lord, you desire. So Lord, depart us with your blessing unto me again, and we give thanks to you, bless you, uh, praying all this in Jesus' most precious name. Amen, amen. Okay, Lord bless you. Thanks for Thank you. you all. Have a good night.